In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. In my preparations for this sermon, I went to a website called pericope.org. It's an excellent resource for pastors preparing sermons. And among the resources available there was a sermon for this Sunday by my old classmate, Pastor Jason Zerbel of Greenwood, Arkansas. Get this. The title of the sermon was Good Enough for Government Work. <laughs> now, Pastor Zerbel and I haven't seen each other for over a decade. So I'm sure he's blissfully unaware that I'm presently working for the government as a census enumerator. But the irony was just too sweet for me to resist. It's good enough for government work. Some of you probably have heard that phrase. Some of you might even know what it means. It's not the best quality work, but it's adequate. It'll do. St. Paul writes, such is the confidence that we have through Christ toward God. Not that we are sufficient, sufficient in ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God, who has made us competent to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. When you hear that word, sufficient, what do you think of? Enough. Adequate. Good enough for government work. But Pastor Zerbel reminds us that the Greek word translated sufficient in the English Standard Version of the Bible might better be translated great, or better yet, worthy, fully qualified, not merely enough, but great enough. So much more than merely adequate or good enough for government work. Lutheran liturgical scholar Fred Lindemann writes, the Christian priest, that's you, is described as qualified to be a minister of a new covenant. He is an enabled man. He is entrusted not merely with a book, but with a divine covenant of grace. Our ability is of God. One of Pastor Mize's recent podcasts had him discussing significant Lutheran events in the 1990s. Well, for a few years during that decade, three theologians who were hugely influential on me were all living in the Minnesota South District of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. The first of these was, of course, my dad. In those days, he was serving a little church called Mount Moriah Lutheran Church in a little town called Byron, Minnesota, just outside our hometown of Rochester. He was also an adjunct professor of religion at Concordia College in St. Paul, now Concordia University. The second of these was the Reverend Dr. Robert Bugby past president of the Lutheran Church Canada. In those days, Pastor Bugby was neither president of the LCC nor a doctor. He was pastor of a church in Monticello, Minnesota, a couple hours north of the Twin Cities. The third was the late, great Dr. Kenneth Corby. In those days, Dr. Corby also was an adjunct professor of religion at Concordia St. Paul. In fact, he and dad shared an office. He was also pastor of an inner city church in St. Paul, the remnant of St. Paul's mother church that wouldn't join the majority in their move to a new neighborhood after the Second World War. Dr. Bugby told me the story of a pastor's conference he attended where Dr. Corby was the guest speaker. As Dr. Bugby recalled, 
Dr. Corby asked the assembled pastors, if you had to lose your eyes or your ears, which would you choose? All the assembled pastors said they'd lose their ears and keep their eyes. Dr. Corby said, you're wrong. As St. Paul wrote in his epistle to the Romans, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. But what if you couldn't hear? What if your ears were closed to all sounds, including the word of Christ? On top of all their other misfortunes, the deaf were unable to be part of the Hebrew worshiping community. A deaf and mute person was condemned to a life of almost total isolation. And you thought social distancing was bad. Things are different now. Now the deaf can communicate by American Sign Language. They can hear with their eyes and talk with their hands. But what if you had to hear with your eyes? What if you had to talk with your hands? One would hope you'd be part of the worshiping community, but there's good news and there's bad news. The good news is that the LCMS has done excellent deaf ministry for decades. The bad news is that whenever budget cutting is called for, deaf ministry always seems to get the short end of the stick. And still, the life of the deaf is often one of isolation. Today's gospel is the story of our Lord healing a deaf and mute man. St. Mark writes, and his ears were opened, his tongue released, and he spoke plainly. Christ opened this man's ears. He unloosed the man's tongue. He freed the man from his isolated existence and restored him to the worshiping community. Lindemann writes, outward need is sad. Need of money, clothes, and what are called the necessaries of life. But the real necessaries are inward, and to lack these is deepest poverty. The deaf and dumb man is a figure of the spiritually poor, who are deaf to the voice of conscience, to the call of God's providence, God's spirit, God's gospel, God's son. The evangelist writes, and Jesus charged them to tell no one. But the more he charged them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. And they were astonished beyond measure, saying, he has done all things well. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. He has done all things well. Not merely adequate, not good enough for government work. He has done all things well, excellently, perfectly. In today's Old Testament reading, Isaiah writes, in that day the deaf shall hear the words of a book, and out of their gloom and darkness the eyes of the blind shall see. Those who witnessed Christ's miracle knew their Isaiah. They knew that sight to the blind and hearing to the deaf were part of the messianic kingdom. But they didn't know the whole story. And St. Mark writes, and taking him aside from the crowd privately, Jesus put his fingers into his ears, and after spitting, touched his tongue. And looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephatha, that is, be opened. Now, when the ESV says sighed, a better translation would be groaned. Ugh. A groan of pain. You see, Jesus has done all things well, but it was neither easy nor cheap. The miracles of Christ weren't the whole story. That's why he charged the crowds not to tell about it. The miracles were the beginning of the beginning of a story 
that would see our Savior taking all our sins and deafness and muteness to Calvary's cross and hanging there with them and dying. But even that isn't the end of the story. On Easter Sunday, he rose from the dead, and the same Savior, who brought hearing and speech to a deaf and mute man, gives life to dead sinners in the waters of holy baptism. And what about us? As Lindemann writes, by nature, we are all deaf. Faith comes by hearing. But how many of us even bother to hear with our eyes, that is, read our Bibles? If you do, an educated guest would tell me you're in the minority. That same Dr. Bugby I told you about said that biblical illiteracy is the great plague of Canada. Most Canadians don't even read their Bibles once a year. And I don't imagine things are much different in the U.S. Again, Lindemann writes, by nature, all are also dumb, averse to prayer, confession, and praise. So, what do we do? I recommend we begin by praying the words of the old hymn. Lo, the hosts of evil round us, scorn the Christ, assail his ways. From the fears that long have bound us, free our hearts to faith and praise. And how does Christ do it? The same way he healed the deaf and mute man. He placed his fingers into the man's ears and spat and touched his tongue. In the same way, he places himself into our ears in his word and on our tongues in his body and blood. And as St. Paul writes, now if the ministry of death carved in letters of stone came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of its glory, which was being brought to an end, will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more glory? For if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, the ministry of righteousness must far exceed it in glory. And instead of the charge to keep quiet about what our Lord has done, we are charged to go and tell. This is the glory of Christ in his new covenant, hearing to the deaf, speech to the mute, life to the dead. What he, what he has done isn't merely adequate. It isn't merely good enough for government work. Our Lord Jesus Christ has done all things well. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We stand.